Dr. Prasannakumar Thomas. He is an alumni of uh, our Madras Medical College and the best uh, outgoing uh, postgraduate. He is a recipient of uh, KV Krishnasamy Gold Medal and a senior consultant pulmonologist at Ramchandra Medical College and MGM Hospitals, Chennai. And his special interest being airway diseases and, uh, and uh, smoking cessation programs. He has given multiple uh, guest lectures, most prominent of them, which is uh, regarding sarcoidosis in uh, Warsaw 2017 and regarding tuberculosis in annual Congress of Philippine Chess Society. He has conducted and participated so many workshops, awareness programs, camps uh, regarding uh, this uh, smoking cessation and his dream to, uh, is to create a tobacco-free India. And all his works and uh, his behavioral uh, changes have uh, inspired many people who have uh, stopped uh, smoking. And uh, now uh, we, he is going to share his thoughts about uh, systemic sclerosis and interstitial lung diseases. Over to you, uh, Prasanna Kumar, sir. I, I want to thank on behalf of IMA Office Barriers for, to Prasanna Kumar Thomas for having readily accepted when we requested him to speak. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Prasanna Kumar Thomas. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're okay. loud and clear. Right. I have to accept that this is one of the few times that I've got this right. But then We'll start with this today. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. I have seen you 10 years before. Pleasure. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go really? imagine how. how um, um, thank you very much. And what are the asked for to meet? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I think it's a great pleasure, a privilege, and an honor to be associated with IMA Port of Lock. I mean, see Dr. Paneer Selvam after so many years. I think just sort of um, stirring my gut as such. I really don't know what to what to say. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. I thank the IMA for having given me the opportunity. My first reaction to um, to what we've heard so far, I think, is there is so much more to medicine than we think there is, and I think that's the whole problem. And I think that has been highlighted by the fact that we left so ignorant and high and dry with the COVID. The fact that we assume so much of knowledge that we do not possess, I think is probably one of the biggest drawbacks in our dealing with patients. And I think we should need to look at a disease, not only from the disease point of view, but also from different points of view, from the biologics, from the moleculars, from the doctor, from the patient, from the person who is a third party. And I think that was one of those things that struck me when they wanted to talk about I enjoyed your talk. <laughs> uh, SSEILD, and I really thought that this was because they wanted somebody from outside to look at um, SSC and then probably look at ILD by themselves. So the content should be the rationale for screening and how do you really pick up, pick the um, SSEILD. So mainly I think the focus of today would be to focus on SSC from trying to pick the ILD and use the interstitial fibrosis as a sort of marker or it's a sort of biologic marker of disease or progress suspicion. Now there are four basic, basic manifestations that you know, autoimmunity, vasculopathy, inflammation, and fibrosis. And I think if you're a pulmonologist, the first thing that you, that you think about when you look at all these four things together, I think would be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or any type of pulmonary fibrosis for that matter. You will think, my God, this is a wonderful place to use the triple kinase inhibitor, like Nintrenib, for example, because it looks at vasculopathy, it addresses inflammation, it addresses fibrosis, and how closely these two are basically related. But then they're so distinctly different in the sense that um, um, SSC has the potential to, to, um, um, to um, manifest with any organ for that matter, the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the nervous system, the cutaneous system for that matter, and of course the lungs and pulmonary fibrosis. I think the first thing to stress here, I think, is the commonality in the etiopathogenesis of this disease between SSC by itself and pulmonary fibrosis. So I think we look at limited skin involvement, 
and diffuse cutaneous involvement. It's obvious that if there is diffuse cutaneous involvement, there is going to be greater internal organ development. But I think the percentages are between 35 and 53 percent. And I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that the minute you have diffuse cutaneous disease, the question of going into this and trying to make out if there is internal organ involvement is very important. And the lung probably is one of the biggest prognostic factors in these as we look at. We talked about pulmonary fibrosis, major predictor of hospitalization. And I think this is something that all of us understand. But I think the question is that many, many times the lung is neglected in patients with um, with SSC for that matter, because today I think um, the so-called MABs, 90% of which I cannot pronounce today, I'm sorry, uh, but I will try to make an attempt to try and pronounce it, be it rotuximab or whatever. That's the only thing that really comes into my mouth. All the rest will be like Chinese to me, really. But the fact this remains, there is so much of biological in involvement in this that the lung is probably taken a backseat. I'm not saying the lung has taken a backseat, but it has taken a back. The question here is that the survival is dependent to a great extent on the presence or the absence of pulmonary fibrosis. And what the type of fibrosis is, is, is something that we'll be looking at. I think a very busy slide, really. But then it looked at direct injury and systemic injury. And again, as I said, you draw a parallel between pulmonary fibrosis and SSC, and that's what is important. Fibrosis, irreversible loss of unfun lung function, unpredictable deterioration. So I think this is classically, if you take off the whole of this slide and leave only that red box there, a pulmonologist will have his eyes wide open. He thinks that this is pulmonary fibrosis. So just to impress on the fact that these are two verticals which are so closely connected with each other, I think it's important for us to realize that the combination of these two things can obviously make things very difficult for patients in the days to come. So, so when, you, when you say that the lung is a problem, you obviously look at the FEC, which is basically a function of, um, uh, which is a, an indicator of lung function. You find that with the FEC, classically correlates with fibrosis, without fibrosis, with a five-year survival, with a 10-year survival. And I think this is so very important. So if you start an SSC with a low FTC, you have a greater mortality. And I think this is important. And I think the parallel to this you can make is with the cardiologist for that matter. And even the Framingham study years ago has told us that if you start with a lower FTC in a patient with long-term congestive cardiac failure, if you start the treatment with a lower forced vital capacity, you have a worse prognosis. And I think that's pretty obvious. So lower the FPC, lower the problem, poorer the prognosis, the presence of fibrosis, I think is very, very important. So this, I think, just restresses the problem, whether there is a fibrosis on the HRCT. And I think therein comes the point that I would think that patients with any amount of systemic of uh, SSC need a HRCT somewhere down the line, and they need prominent HRCT screenings because I think a DLC would be a good thing to do. A pulmonary function test would be a good thing to do. But a pulmonary function test is very difficult to perform in patients who have evidence of pulmonary fibrosis. At least an ER and APS um, um, qualified pulmonary function test is difficult. So, the, so I think the HRCT is an excellent option in these type of patients. I look at this curve on the right and I again think that I am looking at IPF prognosis. What is the prognosis in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? There are three phenotypes. One phenotype moves down very rapidly, and that's the red line. One phenotype slowly tapers off, and that's the green line. And one thing goes on and on and on and on forever and ever. And I think that is the, or, and then that is the other colored line that you're really looking at. I think just to mop up the similarities between the two diseases, the consistent decline in FEV FEB percentage predicted among patient subgroups categorized by prognosis highlights continuing, continued with the monitoring of patients with SSCILD. So how do you screen for them? The male gender, I think, uh, as is the rule, the female gender is the stronger gender. The male gender gets hit. African-American ethnicity, anti topo isomerase, antibody, diffuse protein in the enrollment, older individuals, shorter duration, and this is something that occurs pretty rapidly. Assessment of all established risk factors for interstitial lung disease is important. 
And I think I don't need to stress the importance of occupational involvement for that matter. And also the, involved, the, the exposure to sort of organic elements like uh, things that cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which can cause the same GDS that this, the ground glassing that this produces. If you take Bombay, for example, I think a place where there is so much of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, I think the question of a differential diagnosis is extremely common. And even now in Chennai today, with all these high, high rung flats that are going around, and um, should I say a lot of people from the north uh, coming in for them, it's a sort of ritual to feed the pigeons. So, and the pigeons, I think the problem begins, begins with the pigeons as such. So it is important for us to realize that. The HRCT is pretty, pretty obvious. It's a classic ground glass. There is no honeycombing. There is little reticulation, probably very, very minimal traction for object areas. But it's basically a non-specific interstitial pneumonia pattern or an NSIP pattern in more than 70% of these patients and a UIP in 7.8%. So if you have a UIP with honeycombing, you're probably not dealing with an SSCILD. You're probably dealing with, with something else. And I think the presence of honeycombing and very, very extensive reticulation fibrosis itself is an indicator that you're probably not dealing with SSC. So I think this again becomes important. So auscultation, what are you really going to look for? The PFDs will look for reduced volumes, as I said, but I honestly don't know how often a rheumatologist, for example, does a routine pulmonary function test. And I think um, I really don't want to question rheumatologists here, but I think they need to, we need to open our eyes to other specialities. And I think therein lies the importance, like diabetes and tuberculosis for that matter. And I think there are a lot of associations that we need to, that we need to take into account. And I think a good pulmonary workup should be part of any workup for any collagen vascular disease, leave alone SSCILD, even if it's RA, for example, I think you need a good pulmonary workup. And that means you need three things. You need a spirometry, you need a DLCO, and you need a HRCT. And I think these three things are absolutely important today before we go for all our complicated map stuff. I think we need, need to do the basics, right? Auscultation, the so-called Velcro rolls that you get, I think if you're going to wait for Velcro rolls, you're, all, you're sort of closing the barn door after the horse has bolted, really. So if you get Velcro rolls, it means that you've already gone in for fibrosis and there's not much that you can really do about it. So it's very, very important to pick it up early. And I think the index of suspicion is very important. And one of the earliest indices of suspicion would be extraordinary breathlessness in these people. If they have inordinate breathlessness, I climbed four, five, uh, three flights of stairs two months ago, but today I'm able to climb only one flight of stairs. There is your red flag which is flagging off. There is your red light which is going off and I think you need to do something about it. So the relativity I think is very, very important to these patients and examining them over a period of time, again, I think is extremely important in these patients as such. The guidelines, Absolutely no question, as I told you, a DLCO needs to be performed. But I think if you're going to do a DLCO every six months, it's possible, it's ideal. But I don't really think it's ideal in a country like India with the sort of cost propensity that you're looking at. But I think at least a yearly DLCO, um, in a, at least in an uncomplicated patient, is definitely a word about uh, A word about um, lung ultrasound. I think lung ultrasound is a wonderful modality to look at in patients with um, an SSCILD for that matter. We have plural line, line irregularities that are seen, especially in this, in this um, uh, B box that you're looking at, clear, clear plural line irregularities. Then you have this sort of vertical thing taking off from the uh, plural line irregularities and the plural line thickening, which are enlarged in these patients. So I think the use of lung ultrasound is something that is going to increase. It is already increased in entities. Today in the ICU, it's a very, very, very common and extremely good modality of early workup in these patients. You want to diagnose congestive cardiac failure very quickly. You don't really need, need to wait for big stuff. A good quick ultrasound will tell you um, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the evidence of not only the cardiac function, but also if there is fluid around it at all. So I think lung ultrasound is going to be an important entity in the days to come. And I think this is something that we need to understand of course the safety we all know there's no radiation there is nothing 
selective, but it's selective and operator dependent, and I think that's extremely important. It's not like an X-ray where there is a fair agreement, inter-barrier, uh, inter-reader uh, um, uh, variation in, uh, in, in an X-ray, but an ultrasound is extremely sensitive. What appears like A to you may appear like Z to me, so I think that needs to be taken into account. So at the time of diagnosis, risk factors, HRCT, PFT, so TLCO, if it's possible, I think is extremely important We need to look at that. There is a need for improved screening in these patients. We've already said patients who come with cutaneous involvement and have some of those um, uh, collagen vascular markers. And you think that there is a background of SSC, I think, need for improved screening in line with expert opinion. And I think you need to look at organ damage as well in these patients. The challenges, of course, would be the heterogeneous presentation that you look at, look at in these patients. Even the skin changes are quite heterogeneous. As I said, you can have diffuse um, skin changes, you can have um, very localized skin changes, and sometimes it does become a little impossible. I agree this is an extremely busy slide, but I think the point that really needs to understand is that you need to detect early if you want to do anything at all. And I think this is something that all of us agree upon, be it collagen vascular or be it in interstitial lung disease. We all agree that you need to catch catch the cat early, there's no question about it at all. So early detection and prompt escalation of treatment if it's possible. Reassess, and this is a long-term disease, let's understand that. It doesn't walk away with one prescription. You need to be going back and forth between these things, back and forth between your, your um, uh, um, collagen vascular disease markers, looking at interstitial lung disease, looking at pulmonary function, looking at DLC, or looking at a lot of other things. And I think the HRCT is undergoing an absolute transformation as far as the fibrosis is concerned. There is so much of artificial intelligence and, and um, uh, molecular biology that's coming into HRCT. And sometime down the line, maybe over the, over the next three to four years, we get the HRCT that says fibrosis so many percent, GGS so many percent, reticulation so many percent, and I think it will make our job a little more easier, possibly. It may possibly confuse us a little more even. I'm not quite so sure about it. So I think the uh, question of um, uh, multidisciplinary approach, I think, is extremely important. Now, they have named three guys here. And I think the important guys, pulmonologists, not so very important. Primatologists is very important. Radiologists is very important. But who is this fourth guy? I was really interested in this fourth guy. And... Uh, um, the only thing that I can attribute to in the fourth guy is the referee. The only thing that's missing is his whistle and his yellow card and the red card that the referees have in the IPL. So it's important that um, in this um, uh, question of um, um, uh, multidisciplinary approach, you need to have a good rapport with your pulmonologist, with your radiologist and your rheumatologist. You can't go to war with them. You can't be like Pakistan and China and India and I think fighting the whole time. So I think there needs to be a clear level of coordination. There also needs to be a referee who's willing to pull out the card if it's necessary. And I think it's important that we keep ourselves in our places and try to understand and appreciate others' point of view. And I think that's one of our biggest problems. And I think the older we grow, that problem becomes bigger and bigger. And I think we need to fight it without question because looking at the thing um, it depends not on the way you look at it, but also on the way that the others look at it. So I think it's important that we quite understand that. So monitoring progress, of course, would be HRCT, periodic assessment, lung function changes, and oxygen saturation, as I said. DLCO, I think, is important. So whatever the risk factors in progression, the question of documenting progression of interstitial lung disease in patients with SSCILD is important because it is a major risk factor as far as mortality is concerned. So expert consensus all tell you that pedial pulmonary function test needs to be done, HRCTs need to be done, you need to look at symptoms very closely. The biomarkers are very promising, they are there, they are certainly there, they will be there, there are a lot of, lot of other biomarkers will come, but then they are conflicting at this point of time and no single biomarker predicts for you what this is going to be over a period of time. It's important to look at that. The genetics is always something that you'll be talking about. We didn't talk about a lot of genetics before this, but then um, um, I don't even know if, if I can spell the word genetic properly. 
to be honest with you. So I think at this point of time, at least in interstitial lung disease, the genetics is not a big deal as such. But I think the biomarkers do look a little promising and we'll wait and see if it really comes through. So algorithms for screening, PFT, DLCO, no SSCILD, SSCILD, and then you look at the suspicion of tropos. The question is how quickly do you suspect interstitial involvement in patients with SSC? And I think therein lies the problem. Like you need to treat your SSC, your collagen vascular disease with your rotisimum, whatever you need to treat, you probably need to be early. But at the same time, I think the question of understanding interstitial lung disease and trying to find out that if you are early enough in picking interstitial lung disease, I think is important. So I think catching them early and having a very, very early index of suspicion, I think is extremely important in these patients. And I think this is like, um, um, this is like a rail track, which is got two, two tracks. You've got a collagen vascular track and you have an interstitial track. And you need to keep this thing going to keep this, this sort of train going or such, or the, or the bus riding on this. Otherwise, you're, you're in for an accident as you look at it. So lung auscultation on every visit in pulmonary function, I think this is the understatement of the year. Uh, three to six months in symptomatic patients of normal pulmonary function test. I think the question of timing of pulmonary function test should be left to the physician who's treating this patient. I don't honestly think that you and I should draw the line on the number of pulmonary function tests he needs to do. He needs to be frugal, he needs to be prudent. If you're thinking that every visit needs a pulmonary function test, I would disagree with you. I would definitely say that when and if necessary, please go ahead and do a pulmonary function test. Do a HRCT if it's necessary. Do a, do a DLCO if it's necessary. But then, as I said, the if necessary is always within brackets. And I think it's up to us to find out if it's really necessary at all or not. The so-called census trial, the trial with Nintadenib, I told you about. Nintadenib is the um, triple kinase inhibitor that's being used in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. It's been licensed for patients with SSC as well, including RAILD. And um, it's been used as a sort of a one shirt fits all for all types of progressive lung disease, progressive fibrotic lung disease as such. And I think it does give good results in these patients. And you will find that there is, there is a definite result as far as the FEV1, if FVC is concerned. And I think this is a drug that we will be considering in the poor grade team. As I told you in that first slide, there are so many similarities between SSC and the interstitial lung disease as such. So uh, the commonality of medication, I think, is something that will come to over a period of time. And internet, I think, should, should sort of um, uh, top the list as far as I can see it is. Uh, so this is the scleroderma, cyclophosphamide versus placebo. Obviously, it works, but then it sort of petters off over a period of time. All effects of cyclophosphamide wane and are no longer apparent at 24 months. So it's obvious that cyclophosphamide is not really the answer to patients with um, um, SSC. And I think you look at mycophenolate versus uh, cyclophosphamide, again, extremely important. But again, you look at it, that the improvement from baseline 24 months in growth group, but not at uh, 21 months, but not at 24 months. So you're looking, you want something which is going to produce sustained relief for a period of time. And I think that is what is very important. And that is something that you need to achieve over a period of time. So just the question of using drugs like MMF and cyclophosphamide or anything for that, anything else for that matter, needs to be combined with drugs that work for pulmonary fibrosis, for example. Drugs like Nintrenib, for example, will be a very, very good addition in these patients. You can use them along with the other drugs you're using. Uh, we have used them in many patients along with the biologics that they're using, and we've always found, found to have excellent success. So the summary has been screening and early diagnosis. General consensus that all patients with SSC should be screened with HRCT and PFT. Monitoring of SSCILD for signs of progression has been proposed for every year. For three, three to 12 months, treatment decisions are driven by severity extent to further result on the further research on the optimal treatment. So where are we today? As far as this is concerned, I think yes, the stormy is the question. We don't have any definitive, we don't have any clear niceties as far as this is concerned. We don't have any clear cut lines as far as this is concerned. We are still, I think, in this situation of um, 
of a ship being tossed about in the wild sea, going up and down, not knowing where you're going, but you know where you're coming from. And I think that's the most important thing. We know where SSCILD and SSC and ILD are coming from, but then we don't know where we are going. And I will just close with the words of this great Arthur Ward, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to stop and the realist will adjust the sail. As realists, unless we adjust the sails, I, I don't honestly think our patients with SSAI we are going to be benefited. So I think we need this sort of um, a multidisciplinary approach. And of course, we need a good referee and very few yellow and red cards. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Please stay safe and God bless you all.